Hi guys, so as promised, this is going to be the second part of the recording of your 2017 exam paper that I um, um, start, that I recorded for you in the last session. We went from question one to question three in the last recording, that was just over an hour, so I'm going to um, go from question four to question seven, I think it is, the rest of the paper um, for this recording. Okay, so I'm just going to go over to share my screen and then I can um, go to the PDF of the paper to, oopsie, to do it with you. So guys, also just remember, please ask me any questions, anything that you don't understand about um, any of the questions. Why did they get a particular, how did they get a particular amount? Why did they do a particular, um, calculation in the way that they did uh, anything whatsoever, please send me a message. There's, um, don't sit at home and, and worry about even the smallest thing that you're not sure of how it works, because that might just be the one thing that comes up in, um, in the exam, and then you'll wish that you, that you asked me to help you. Okay, so don't be shy to, um, to ask me. That's exactly what we are here for, is specifically so that you've got somebody to reach out to with questions if there's anything academically that you don't understand. Okay, all right, so here we go with question four. Let me just grab my textbook. So this one is um, from Learning Unit 7. And it comes from the, uh, the mergers and takeovers learning unit. And this particular one is a, an acquisition of one company by another company uh, using, a sh the, using a share swap. This has been a very popular question in exam papers in the past. So I'm not sure if they'll ask it again, but it does contain a lot of um, theory, etc., that you need to know anyway for other questions. So let's have a look at what we've got here. We've got Cruise Control Limited, an international car hire company, is making an attempt to acquire Road Trip Limited, which is a local South African car hire company. Okay, so Cruise Control Limited is the acquirer and Road Trip Limited is the target company. In order to gain access to the established client base that Road Trip Limited has built within South Africa. Cruise Control Limited is considering acquiring Road Trip Limited through a share swap using an exchange ratio of 1.5. Okay, so what does an exchange ratio mean? And how did they cal how was that 1.5 calculated? Sometimes in a question, they will ask you to calculate the exchange ratio. Um, and not give it to you. So make sure you know how to do that. You'll find this on page 225, page 225 in your textbook. So when we talk about the exchange ratio, we are um, talking about the number of shares of the acquiring company that are going to be swapped for each one share of the target company. So what we're saying here is that cruise control will have to give or issue one and a half shares in their company to the shareholders of Road Trip Limited for each one share in Road Trip Limit Limited that they want to acquire. Okay, so they'll basically be paying one and a half shares for one share. Remember, it's a share swap. So I you will give me one share and I will give you one and a half shares in exchange. That's the exchange ratio. The management of Cruise Control Limited anticipate that the PE ratio at, the, at which the company will sell, in other words, the current PE ratio, will remain unchanged after the merger. So that's important because we're going to use the PE ratio um, for calculations later. So remember this information. They've told you right up the top that your PE ratio is going to be the same. Whatever the PE ratio calculates to being now, it will still be that same PE ratio after the merger. So remember price earnings ratio means um, 
the market price, the P stands for the market price of the share um, over the EPS of the share. So it's saying, um, and, and often we say the PE ratio is X number of times. So we're saying uh, if the PE ratio is five, what we are saying is I am going to, I am paying five times the current earnings of this company for one share of the company. So that's why it's market price over EPS. Earnings and share data of each company are summarized as follows. So we've got cruise control, which is the acquirer. Um, and this here is the target company. So just remember which is which. Don't get that muddled up because that's the worst thing to do is if you, that's the target company. Um, Earnings, so these would be annual earnings, number of ordinary shares in issue, and then the current share price of each of the companies. So the first thing that we have to do is calculate the earnings per share and the PE ratio of each company before the merger. So with this information that they've given us at the top, calculate EPS and PE ratio. So if you have a look on the right hand side of the screen, the easiest way to do it is in these two columns because then you only need to write the description of, um, each, cal of each calculation down once. And remember, as I said to you previously in the questions, it's very important in financial management that we lay our work out like this with headings and descriptions of what we're doing. There's, there really is no other way to do management accounting. So um, earnings per share is total annual earnings attributable to ordinary shareholders divided by the number of ordinary shares in issue. So we take our earnings for each company and we divide it by the number of shares in issue. So earnings divided by the number of shares pre-merger EPS is 20 Rand for cruise control and 15 Rand for road trip. So 12,750 divided by 850,000 shares equals 15 Rand. And then the PE ratio is price over EPS. So here's our price, 120 over 20 Rand, which is what we've just calculated. So this has got a, e a PE ratio of six. And this one here, um, price 75 over EPS. So P over E equals five. So that would have given you four marks for that calculation to date. Then the second one, they said calculate the additional number of shares that cruise control will need to issue to the shareholders of road trip in order to complete the acquisition. And what will be the total number of shares in issue post merger? So remember, this is a share swap. So we have to now say how many shares does cruise control have to give to road trip as the swap in order to acquire all of the shares in, in road trip. So we're going to use our exchange ratio here. They were given it to us. They said one and a half shares of cruise control limited for each one share of road trip. We know that there's 850,000 shares in road trip that we are acquiring. So the calculation is then 850 shares that we want to purchase from road trip and we are paying one and a half shares for each one of those. So we have to issue 1.275, 1.275 million new shares of cruise control in order to purchase those 850,000 shares. So then what happens basically is that these 850,000 shares in road trip cease to be exist they like retired and we now have in total 2.775 million shares in cruise control those would all be cruise control shares and there are no longer any road trip shares okay and remember that total is total number of shares in cruise control um, prior to the merger plus the new quantity of shares that we've issued um, and that equals then the total number of shares in the new merged company. 
then 4.3 calculate the market price exchange ratio. So over here where we just talk about an exchange ratio, that is comparing the number of shares. When we say market price exchange ratio, we are saying in terms of um, RAND values, how much did I pay for each share or um, what was, the, again, the ratio? But this time in, in terms of co comparing the RANDs that I have given to the road trip shareholders for the RAND value of each one of their share. So Cruise Control Limited, current share price is 120 and we are giving them one and a half of those shares. So 120 times one and a half, because that's what I've promised to exchange. So that rand value over, because remember it's a ratio, over 75 rand, which is the price of one share of road trip. And that equals 2.4. So the exchange ratio is 1.5 and the market price exchange ratio is 2.4. Okay. Then 4.4, calculate the post-merger earnings per share of both companies. So let's just put this information there so you can see it. So what we do is we take the um, earnings of cruise control and we add to that the earnings of road trip and we add those two together. So that is the total earnings of the merged company. Often in questions, they will have mentioned in the information that they've given you here somewhere, the fact that there would be expected um, synergies, which would lead to an additional financial benefit, increased income as a result of the merger. Lots of the questions have that, so just be sure to read all the information properly because this is where you would then use it in the question. So let's say, for instance, if they had said the company expects to realize um, an extra 5 million shares, uh, sorry, an extra 5 million rands earnings per year as a result of synergistic benefits after the merger, then to this 42,750 would then also add that extra 5 million synergistic benefits. Okay, in this particular example, we've just got the combined earnings of the two companies. So because this is now the merged company, we are going to divide the merged earnings by the new total number of shares. So 42,750,000 divided by the 2.775 million shares is then going to give us the EPS post merger of 15 Rand 41. But now take note, remember these 2.775 million shares are the number of shares that now exist in cruise control. So that is the earnings for one share of cruise control. In the question here, they've said, give us the um, post merger earnings Per share of both companies. So what they mean that is if you were a shareholder of Road Trip, you would have received one and a half shares of cruise control for each share that you previously owned in Road Trip. So your earnings now as a, a, a prior Road Trip shareholder is now one and a half times the earnings of cruise control. Okay, that's obviously a theoretical earnings per share. That share doesn't exist anymore, but it's just saying to now measure as a road trip shareholder, you want to measure, was it beneficial to me to have swapped my one share for one and a half shares of cruise control? Um, so if you have a look at the top over here, where we calculated the EPS, pre-merger EPS, um, road trip, you would have had 15 Rand EPS for your one road trip share before the merger. And now that 
you, the earnings that you are now, the value of the earnings you are now receiving for each one share of road trip that you previously held is 23 Rand 12 cents. So it is beneficial. And then have a look at something else. The pre-merger EPS of cruise control was 20 Rand. And it is now 15 Rand 41. So if you were a cruise control shareholder, previously your earnings per share would have been 20 Rand and that has now decreased to 15 Rand 41 per you still own one share of cruise control. So we're going to come back to that in one of the next questions. Then 4.5 says calculate the expected market price per share of cruise control post merger. So remember I mentioned earlier the PE ratio, they told us that the PE ratio is going to be the same before and after the merger. And we know what the PE ratio was prior to the merger. So remember there's three variables in um, calculating the PE ratio. There's the market price of the share, the P, there's the earnings per share, the E, and there is the actual PE ratio itself, the six. So wherever there's three variables, as long as you know what two of the variables are, you can calculate the missing third variable. So we know that six is going to is what the PE ratio is because they told us that's not going to change. We know the, the EPS of the um, of cruise control is now 15 Rand 41. So with that information, we can now calculate the, um, the P part of the formula. Just the price is what's missing. So if we take EPS multiplied by the PE ratio, the earnings times six, because remember we said that PE ratio says that that six means that if I were to buy one of these shares, that means I would be willing to pay six times the current earnings of the share. So there we go. Six times the current earnings of the share is 92 Rand 46. So the expected market price post merger is now that we know what the post merger EPS is, we can calculate as being 92 Rand 46. And then question 4.6. Here they want us to discuss why the expected market share price is either higher or lower than the current pre-merger share price. So the expected market price is 92 Rand 46. The pre-merger share price was 120 Rand. So for cruise control, the expected share price has decreased from 120 Rand to 92 Rand 46. But remember, part of that story is what I've already showed you that the EPS previously was 20 Rand per share, and it's now 15 Rand 41 per share. So that's part of the reason. Um, so in our case, we are going to discuss why the expected market price is lower than the current share price. Uh, you'll find this in your textbooks. This discussion is exactly in the textbook. So the share price of the merged company has fallen owing to the dilutive effect of the additional shares. Because remember, we've the, the amount of earnings we've got has to be divided by the new greater number of shares. And because we paid one and a half, we had to issue an additional one and a half shares for each one share of um the target company, the number of share, the number of shares in cruise control grew to a larger number at a at a greater proportion than the earnings than the earnings did. Dilutive effect of the additional shares issued for the acquisition of road trip and the fact that the PE multiple did not change as a result of the merger. Okay, so as long as you discuss it, you explain it in your own words, something like what I've said, remember with these things, always, as long as you understand what happened, you could 
see the numbers. You've got the numbers before and after the merger. You can compare to see what went up, what went down, what changed, what didn't change. You can use that to explain. But it's important that you understand so that you can then explain in your own words. Then you don't have to memorize all of this um, theory. And then the last one is list and explain any five ways that economies of scale can be achieved, thus le leading to synergistic benefits in the form of cost savings for the newly merged car hire company. So in your textbooks, so your share swaps, whole section on um, share swaps um, <clears throat> is from page 225. <coughs> beg your pardon, in your textbooks. And these calculations that we've been doing in this question continue page two to six, page two to seven, impact on the share price, page two to nine. Um, they've got merger negotiation process, page 231. Uh, and this list of um, economies of scale is on page, where is it? I found it last night. Now I can't find it. Don't want that. Don't want that. It's quite an interesting chapter, especially if you read this section at the end of the chapter about um, hostile takeovers and, and there's, there's several different defense actions against hostile takeovers, and then also reasons why mergers um, fail. That's also a very good theory question at the end of um, the chapter as well. And it is interesting. So, uh, and you will also, if you follow business news, you will definitely come across those. Guys, weird, I can't find it now. It's just like, oh, here we go. I knew it was there somewhere. Page 217. Um, synergy through operating economies of scale. And you've got one, two, three, four, five, six bullet points on that page, which you could then have, um, you needed to list five of them to get those 10 marks. Another question that comes up often in this merger section. So if you, if you is, um, what type of merger is it? So on page 215, we've got the four types of mergers, horizontal, vertical, congeneric, or conglomerate. So make sure you know, you can name all four of those and that you know what the characteristics of each of those are. So that again, if they describe a merger like this, you would then be able to say, okay, this is what type of merger, um, what type of merger it is. So this particular one, that here in question four would have been a horizontal merger, two companies in the same industry or line of business. Okay. So I think that is, is that all of, um, yeah, and then that's all of question four, which basically really covers most of that mergers and takeover learning unit seven. Okay, so then we can go on to having a look at question five. So this question five we've already covered in, um, I think both of the other papers um, that I've uploaded for you already, um, this lease or buy section. Um, this is in learning unit six, which is called leases, hybrid and derivative financial instruments. So the first part of Learning Unit 6 covers leases, where we look at the, the calculations for the lease or buyer decision, and then all of the theory involved in advantages and disadvantages, etc. as well. It's an important section of work, and you should already be quite familiar with this, because I don't remember from Finance 2, we already looked at the lease or buyer decision in Finance 2 already. And then the rest of this chapter is then um, options, which was covered in the previous two exam papers that we did. Uh, share purchase warrants, which weren't in either of the two papers. Um, and then convertible instruments is the fourth 
theme in learning unit six. So in this question, they only give us the information for the buy side of the decision. So that we've got Health Limited is considering importing technologically advanced machinery from Taiwan in order to increase its overall production capacity and improve the quality of its finished products with the aim of being able to increase its market share in the local market. These bits of information are often important because often they'll ask some other question later on at the bottom where you need to understand the circumstances of the purchase of the machine, why they did it and what it means for the company um, in terms of the theory. So that's not, um, to that's not totally irrelevant. Um, You'll probably also remember from the end of learning unit one reasons for expansion when you were doing those capital budgeting technique chapters. A lot of that is incorporated in this question as well. So for the buy option, the machinery costs one and a half million and it's got a four year lifespan. They're entitled to an income tax capital allowance, 40% in the first year and 20% per annum in the remaining three. The total purchase price will be financed by a four-year loan at an interest rate of 15% per annum. And our annual payments, our PMT, is going to be 5253.9803 and will be made in arrears. That just means at the end of each year. Health Limited will also pay 20,000 Rand for insurance in the first year. However, the insurance premium is expected to increase at a rate of 10.5% per annum each year, only for years two and three. Okay. So 20,000 in year one, then plus 10.5% in year two, and then again plus 10.5% in year three. And then it will increase by 12% in year four. Due to technological advancements, the running costs of the machinery, including um, electricity and water, is expected to decrease by 10% per annum only from year two to the end of year four. And currently, the running costs for year one is expected to be 75,000. You've got to really read carefully what's the percentage and precisely which year does it apply to, from which year up to which year. Um, this is where students often make mistakes. They read 10 and a half and they just apply from year one and, and so on and so forth. You've got to read the information really carefully. So you'll see, I've always told my students, take a highlighter with you to the exams because you can see now if you read back here, your pertinent information that you're going to need for the calculations is immediately, you've highlighted that and you could quickly find it without having to reread everything again. And in this way also, you're not going to miss important information. They intend utilizing the machinery beyond the end of the four year period uh, to maintain operations, which means they're not going to sell it. There's no sale of the machine at the end of the fourth year. A tax rate of 28% applies and that the deductible cash flow relating to the lease or buy decision arises in the year that it accrues. So no, the tax is not paid in arrears, it's paid in the year that it accrues and that the company has got sufficient taxable income, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Required, 5.1, calculate the annual interest cost of the buy alternative for all four years. So they were quite clever with this question for eight marks. They didn't say, um, calculate the amortization table for the purchase of the machine. They said calculate the annual interest cost of the buy alternative, which they then expected you to realize, to know that the way to calculate what the interest is for each of the four years is through working out the amortization schedule. There's our four years worth of interest. So you absolutely, you've done amortization schedules in year, in second year as well. Um, you must end in, um, 
second year accounting and in no sorry third year accounting and in second year finance so must make sure you absolutely know how to do that because then that's an easy eight marks so we always start our amortization schedule out with the outstanding cost of whatever it is that we are paying for so the machinery costs one and a half million they didn't say anything about a deposit so our full amount that we're starting out owing is the one and a half million if they had have said we paid a 200,000 Rand deposit, you would have used the one and a half in the opening balance column. And then under the installment column, you would have then have deducted whatever the value of the deposit was, so that the closing balance here would then be the purchase price, excluding any deposit made up front. And then for each one of these four years, you do exactly the same calculation. <clears throat> your closing balance is obviously then your opening balance for each year. So we take our opening balance multiplied by the interest rate, one and a half million times 15%. And that is what you write down here in the interest column. Opening balance times the interest rate equals the interest. And then the installment has been given to you. So you have got that. You write that down in all four years, that's not going to change. And now you just have to work out what the closing balance is. And in order to do that, opening balance minus the amount that we paid, the installment, plus the interest charges for the year will then equal the closing balance. Okay. And then your closing balance becomes the next year's opening balance. Second year, I'll say it again, opening balance multiplied by the interest rate equals the amount of interest for that year. Opening balance minus the installment plus the new interest equals the new closing balance. And then you bring that forward. And you keep doing that for the number of years they told you four years. So you do that for four years. And if your calculations have been correct, you will end up with a zero as your closing balance at the end of the last year of the payment schedule. Um, so remember, they've given you the installment. So this installment has been pre-worked out as the PMT with the, um, the opening balance being the present value, the interest rate being I and the installment being PMT. They've worked that out so that the future value will be zero. Okay. They've given a financial calculator version here. If, um, as I said here, present value, N is 4, I is 15, the PMT is 525, and then you work using the um, AMRT button on your calculator, which stands for amortization. Um, you can then calculate the interest for each of those years um, in a, uh, using the financial calculator. Just have a look in your, your calculator would have come with a little instruction booklet. Go and find amortization in there and practice with your calculator so that you, can, you know that you're pressing all the right buttons. Or Google it, you'll find that somewhere on YouTube, I'm sure, or somewhere exactly what to, how to do that. Um, or just use this amortization table. I'm old school. I like to see exactly what I'm doing. I trust myself and I don't always trust that I've pressed, I haven't mispressed or cleared a memory. So I like to write this out and see exactly what I'm doing. And I can also check myself again if I've done it. But it's entirely up to you which method you prefer, as long as you get to the right answer. And then for 5.2, they said calculate the tax shield for the buyer alternative for all four years. So remember, when we talk about the tax shield, we are going to write up a schedule for each year, which details all of the expenses which are tax deductible. Okay, so this has got nothing to do with whether it was a cash flow or not, but whether it is a tax deductible expense. Is the expense allowed to be deducted 
when I do my tax calculation. So the items that we can deduct are interest, my interest expense, which you're going to get from your amortization table here. And here's our four amounts of interest from year one to year four. So that's the interest written across there. My running costs, I think they said this was electricity and water, am I not, am I right? Running costs, including electricity and water. Okay, they said for year one is expected to be 75,000. So there's our 75,000. And is expected to decrease by 10% per annum from year two onwards. So they haven't showed the workings on this memo. You have got to show your workings. Usually on the memos, they do show workings. This is an older one. I don't know why it doesn't have the workings on it. But this would be, you would have your workings here, 75,000 minus 10% equals 67.5. 67.5 minus 10% equals 67.50. And 67.50 minus 10% equals 54.675. Then our insurance, 20,000 Rand in the first year. So there is our 20,000 Rand in the first year. However, it is expected to increase at a rate of 10.5 per annum for years two and three. So your calculation here is 20 plus 10.5 percent equals 22,100. Your calculation here is 22,100 plus 10.5 percent equals 24,420.50. And your calculation for year four is then 12% for year four is going to be 24 for 2050 plus 12% equals 27, 350, 96. Our capital allowance, um, ba, 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 they said 40% in year one and 20% for the remaining years. So again, show your calculation. One and a half million times 40% equals 600. One and a half million times 20% equals 300 and that's for the remaining three years so those four items were our four tax deductible expenses um, so you add them up total for each year and then we calculate tax at 28 percent of the total so we then got the tax shield remember they said calculate the tax shield the tax shield means um, because I've got these expenses that I can deduct from my taxable income before I calculate my tax payable to SARS, I have actually saved 257,600 rands worth of tax in year one. It's actual physical cash that I won't have to pay to SARS because I purchased this machine thereby incurring these tax deductible expenses. So even though I've got expenses, I've actually also got a saving to offset some of these expenses. That's what tax shield means. And don't forget to do that for all four, um, all four years. And then our 5.3 is calculate the after tax cash flow for all four years. Okay, so remember tax shield we want the tax deductible expenses list and uh, after tax cash flow, we only want those amounts that actually went in or out of our bank account. So any non-cash amounts like capital allowances, etc., would not appear in this list because they are non-cash amounts. And also remember for the buyer alternative, our cash flow is the entire installment. So our, our cash flows then are the installment that we pay to the bank, our running costs, water and electricity, we are physically paying that out in cash, our insurance is physically being paid out in cash. And then take note, those are all in brackets, those are cash flows out. And then the tax shield that we calculated there is then a cash flow in. So minus, 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 plus, and that then gives you the total after tax cash flow. 
and that's for each year. In this particular question as well, they haven't given us any um, increased sales or contribution or anything that the machine provided. This is really just looking at the actual expenses, the tax shield, and in terms of the cash flow, again, we've only got the actual um, expenses and, and tax shield as our cash flows. There were no how many units did we sell, etc. It all depends on how they're going to um, word the question or give you the question. Okay, but hopefully by now you've done lease or buy a couple of times. So hopefully by now that question you guys are um, are good with that particular question. Um, did I give you the page number in the textbook for that? It's page 181, page 181, example 6.1, lease or buy. And then on page 180 is where the discussion about lease or buy starts. And then you've got example 6.1 on page 181 with um, going over the page, example 6.2, etc., all the way through to the end of example 6.4. Oh, and I must also just mention um, the other thing that they didn't ask in this question, which they could have, is then for you to calculate the net present value of the cash flows and perhaps compare it to something else, um, which in your textbook you'll see. Why did I turn that page over? Um, on page 184. They then calculate the net present value in that particular example. They've got a lease and a buyer alternative. So go through lease or buyer from page one from page 180 from example 6.1 through to the end of example 6.4. And that takes you through the whole procedure of this particular question that we've gone through, including the bits that they didn't ask us in this paper. Obviously, if they wanted us to calculate a net present value, they would have had to give us a cost of capital percentage as well in the question. So that we had a percentage to use to calculate our discount factors for each year. Just give me one sec. Okay. Question six, learning unit two. This is um, on capital structure. Going back to page 45 and our leverage and capital structure chapter. Um, and I just looked for the most similar example to what they've asked in this question, and that's example 2.3 on page 45. But obviously, all the information in the textbook before and after that example will all be relevant to learning unit two questions. So here they've said Universal Limited currently has 250,000 authorized shares. Please be wide awake and read carefully all the words they've given you. Only 30% of the authorized shares have been issued. Okay, so make sure that you understand the difference between authorized shares and shares in issue. You would have done that in second year accounting. Um, you should be familiar with that from um, second year accounting, from your EPS chapter. The debt ratio is 40%. What does that mean? The debt ratio is 40%. What are they telling you there? So again, going back to finance second year, learning unit two, all of those ratios and interpretations. I, I also keep always telling the students that is such an important learning unit in your um, in the course that you're doing. You use those ratios so many times across the board. And if you don't know what the debt ratio is, if you can't remember it from learning unit two and finance two, then you're going to be stuck with this question. So the debt ratio is debt to equity. Um, in other words, debt over equity. So they're saying that debt is 40% of the 
of the value of my equity. My debt value is 40% of that of my equity. And debt is 750,000 Rand. So given that information, they've given us the Rand value of the debt. They've told us that that's 40% of equity so with that information we can calculate equity which will be 750,000 divided by 40 times 60. The interest on the debt is did I say that right? I'll think about it I'll come back to it in a minute. The interest on the debt is 13 and a half percent per annum I've been so busy with my first years and their markups and um, gross margins that I'm muddling my calculations up. Um, the interest on the debt is 13.5% um, per annum. The company is considering paying its debt from the proceeds of a new share issue. Okay, they want to, they con this is what they're considering, the scenario they're considering is this debt of 750,000. If they issue new shares to the value of 750,000 um, and then use that money raised from the issue of the new shares to pay off that debt, to pay that debt down to zero. So what would happen in that scenario? Debt would go down to zero and equity would increase. by the value of the new shares that they issued. It is expected that the new share issue will have no effect on the share price. So our share price will be the same before and after, and we can ignore issue costs in this particular case. The company has budgeted to make a profit before interest and tax, so an EBIT of 350,000 in the coming year. However, if the company enters a recession, EBIT will decline by one quarter of the budgeted 350,000, but if the economy expands, EBIT would be triple of what was budgeted, three times what was budgeted, and our tax rate is 28%. Calculate the earnings per share for the current capital structure under the budgeted and the recession conditions. So that was why I indicated you towards example 2.3 because that shows you how we starting with EBIT, listing what we've got, we can then calculate our earnings per share. So um, you want to do your answer in a table like this. I know a lot of you used AI for your assignment and it was in this long verbal written thing that was impossible to follow. Please, guys, do it like this, as it's in your textbook in example 2.3 with these columns where it's very clear to follow what you've, what you've done and what each line is. So we do it exactly the same as we would draw up a, 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 a um, statement of um, profit and loss. Okay. So we've got the budgeted scenario and we've got recession. So they've told us 350,000. That's what they gave us. EBIT of 350 and here they've said um, for the current capital under the budgeted and the recession conditions is what they want for 6.1. So we go and have a look here. They said if the economy enters a recession, EBIT will be one quarter less than it was. So you can say, please show your work in seven, 350,000 times 0.75 or 350,000 minus 25% equals the recession EBIT. Then your interest, because remember they said um, under the current capital structure, so for both of these current capital structure, which means we still have that debt of 750,000 that we're paying 13.5% per annum. So our interest cost is 750,000 times 13.5% and that will be the same both in the budgeted and in the recession scenarios. EBIT, earnings before interest and tax, we then take off interest, which gives us profit before tax. 
then we calculate the tax at 28% and deduct that, and that gives us profit after tax, which is then what we assume to be the profit attributable to ordinary shareholders. We then work out how many shares we have got. Where was that information? Um, 250,000 authorized shares, but only 30% of those are in issue. So we must use the shares in issue to calculate the EPS which is then 75,000 shares. So profit after tax divided by the shares in issue equals our earnings per share. And then we've got that for the budgeted and the recession. So the only thing that really changed here in the recession column was that the EBIT reduced. Interest was exactly the same. And then obviously all of the um, Profit before tax, profit after tax, etc., would be less because of a lower EBIT. Then 6.2 says calculate your earnings per share. So the same format for the proposed capital structure. So in other words, for raising 750,000 rands worth of capital via the issue of shares and using that to get rid of the debt under the budgeted and expansion conditions. Please read carefully current capital structure, budgeted and recession, proposed capital structure, budgeted and expansion. I can't tell you when I mark papers like this how many students just misread and they, if, you, if you've done the incorrect calculation here, you 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 can't get any marks so please 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 it's it's the most important thing i say to all the students all the time is read your paper carefully slow down take a highlighter underline make notes but just make sure that you're doing exactly what was asked in the question so 6.2 so again our EBIT is going to now be the same. The budgeted is still 350,000, but now we've got to work out the expansion EBIT, which is going to be triple of what was budgeted. So 350,000 times three is then the expansion EBIT. Then interest is going to be zero because remember the proposed capital structure is that we will have repaid our debt. So there will be no um, interest in either scenario. So our profit before tax is then going to be whatever the same as the EBIT. Minus 28% tax gives us profit after tax. And then um, we want to divide that by the number of shares, which will now have increased because we have issued new shares to pay off the debt. Let me just show you the calculation. Um, here you go. So remember we said that they, they told us that the RAND value of our debt is 750,000 and that the, that's a, represents a debt ratio of 40%. So here they've got different scenarios, um, 750,000 divided by 40% equals 1125, which is your capital, or here yeah, divided by 40 times 60. Oh, I did have it right. Is that what I said? Yeah, I said 750 divided by 40 times 60. That's a calculation that I would have done. That gives you um, the RAND value of the equity, current equity, 1125. We know that we've got to raise 750,000 rands to pay off that debt, which means we have to sell shares. But where, how are we going to know what the value, current market value of a share is? So we have to work that out as well. So if we know what the value of the equity is, which is 1125, and we know how many shares there are in issue, which is 30% of the authorized shares, we can then work out the current market price of a share is 15 rand. So that was a little bit tricky. Now that we know that, we can take the 750,000 Rand, which is the amount we have to raise, 
divide it by 15 Rand, and that tells us we have to sell 50,000 shares at 15 Rand. Remember, they told us we could ignore issue costs. So just the 15 Rand per share, we didn't have to take any issue costs into account. So now, with the proposed capital structure, we would have our original 75,000 shares plus our newly issued 50,000 shares. We will have 125,000 shares in issue. And that's where we get 125,000 here. Profit after tax divided by 125,000 shares equals my EPS with the proposed capital structure under budgeted conditions of two rand and two cents. And then you can compare that current capital structure with the debt. EPS is two rand 39. And proposed the EPS would only be two rand and two cents. And then on the right hand side, the expansion, we've calculated the um, three times the budgeted EBIT as my um, EBIT under expansion conditions. Also no debt, everything else is the same. Profit minus tax, profit after tax, you'd use the same number of shares and you would get six rand and five cents, um, which would be the EPS under the expansion if the economy expanded. So this question was for 15 marks. I personally think that's quite a lot of work for 15 marks because 15 marks means you've got 15 minutes. So you have to have completed both 6.1 and 6.2 in 15 minutes. So just bear that in mind when you are looking at these questions and practicing them that you time yourself. So practice the question, write it out over and over again and make sure that you can get it correct in within 15 minutes. Okay, so that was um, 6.1 and 6.2. And then I think, yeah, we've got a seven question seven. This is also something similar to what you have done before, which is your cost of equity. So this is learning unit one, cost of capital. Just give me one sec. Okay. So for 20 marks, um, let's have a look. Just let's have a look at the memo quickly because that tells us what the required is going to be. We're going to have to calculate the cost of equity. We're going to have to calculate the cost of preference shares and we're going to have to calculate the cost of bonds. So three different sources of capital that they've got in their capital structure that we need to calculate the cost of and then calculate the WACC, weighted average cost of capital, given the fact that we have got those three types of capital in our, um, in our books. Okay, so let's have a look over here. Smarty Limited Manufacturers paper, they've asked your assistance to prepare the analysis for a new manufacturing facility in order to calculate the net present value for the project. So you know that whenever we calculate a net present value, we have to have a percentage to use as our discount factor. That What percentage are we going to use to discount the cash flows of, that, of, those, um, of the estimated cash flows from the project? With this type of... Um, scenario where it's a it's a big project you would use weighted average cost of capital because you would your capital for investing in your new manufacturing facility would come from a combination of equity preference shares and bonds so we need to know what the weighted average cost is of all the capital at our disposal so we can use that percentage to then calculate the net present value of our cash flows. So in order to conduct the analysis, you need to calculate the company's required rate of return. 
So what formula do we use to calculate required rate of return? Can you remember? Capital asset pricing model, CAPM, is required rate of return and have been provided with the following information from the financial manager regarding the capital structure of the company. Ordinary equity, <clears throat> 10 million shares are in issue. They were initially issued at a par value of 20 rand per share, but are currently trading at 20% higher than par value. So current market value will be 20 times 1.2. And that's just the share price, remember? Then preference shares, we've got 2 million and their coupon rate is 9% and they were issued at 100 Rand per share. So remember, whatever preference shares or um, bonds are issued at, their coupon rate is always paid as a percentage of the par value of the share. They are currently trading at a discount of 10% on the initial issue price. So 100 times 0 0.90 would be their current market price per share. And then we've got debt, 60,000 bonds with a par value of 1,000 Rand each were issued three years ago. So they've already been in existence and their coupon rate is 12%. So the interest on the bonds is going to be the par value of a, of a thousand rand times 12%. The bonds are currently trading at a premium of 5% with a 10% yield to maturity, YTM. Additional information, Smarty has recently declared a dividend recently. So that means our last dividend, D0, was one rand fifty per share. It's expected that dividends will grow at a constant rate of three percent per annum in the future. So there, they have given us the growth rate G. The company tax rate is twenty eight percent. You may assume that preference dividends are not tax deductible. So um, where was our preference dividends? that 9% is already after tax. In other words, we don't have to calculate an after tax cost of the preference shares because they are not tax deductible. We pay the preference shares out after tax money. So we take uh, profit before tax, subtract tax, calculate the um, profit after tax, and then we deduct, we pay the preference shares out of that money. And then after we pay preference shares, out of our profit, what's left over is then the profit attributable to ordinary shareholders. Um, company policy to use the dividend growth model to determine the cost of equity. So your dividend growth model, cost of debt, redeemable, cost of preference shares. Our cost of equity starts on page 16. Dividend growth model is on page 18, page 1.8. And 7.1 says calculate the weighted average cost of capital based on the market value weights for Smarty Limited for 18 marks. Um, okay, just go back here. So we've got the information that we want on the screen. So always, um, I tell my students, Always, when they have asked you for weighted average cost of capital, then at the top of your page, you are going to draw this table because this is your weighted average cost of capital table that you need to produce. You know exactly what its headings and um, line items are going to be. So you draw that up and then underneath that, you go and do your workings, calculate all three market values, calculate all three costs, then work out the weightings and then work out the weighted averages and then the total WACC. But it helps to have this down on the page in front of you so that you can always see exactly, OK, what do I have to go and calculate next? I want to calculate the um, 
the cost of ordinary equity, the cost of preference shares, the cost of debt. And then as you do the calculation, you write it into the table. Because have a look at this table, and it is usually like this. You will see that your the only things that are not method marks are some of what is in the market value. But the total is method. All of your weightings will be method marks. Your costs will be method marks because you will have you are expected to have carried them down from whatever calculations you've done. And your weighted average then is also method marks as well as the total. So if we count here, we've got, there's a half, there's one method mark, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's eight method marks in this table. And as long as you've written the correct table down with the correct headings and you've put amounts in here, you automatically get those eight marks. Okay. So if you get muddled up with your calculations for the costs, don't abandon the question. You can get it out of 20 marks. So even you can get those eight method marks and that's nearly 50% of the total question just from writing down your table correctly. Okay, so let's have a look at our calculations. Um, ordinary equity, <clears throat> cost of equity, they told us we use the dividend growth model, which is um, PO equals D1 over um, R minus G or K minus G in some of the formulas. So we need to calculate D1 Where was that information about the dividend here? They've recently declared a dividend of one rand 50 per share, and that's expected to grow at a rate of 3%. So one rand 50 times 1.03, that will then calculate D1, which is the next dividend that we're going to pay out. Um, over RE minus G, um, I can't see what my workings are here. Oh, here we've calculated, yeah, it's under cost of equity, they've calculated the market price of the shares, which is 20% um, higher than par value. So 20 rand times 1.2, the current market price is 24. We're going to use that here. We've got 10 million shares at a market price of 24. So that's that taken care of. Um, RE equals, uh, 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 where am I? A formula that we want to solve for RE, which is cost of capital using the dividend growth model, is RE is equal to D1 over PO plus G. So here's D1 over PO means the current market price of the share plus G is the 3% that they gave us and we then calculate 9.44% as the cost of equity and we write it into our table over there. No tax adjustments necessary for cost of equity. Cost of preference shares, remember they told us that that's going to be paid out after um, after tax, so no tax adjustment necessary for that. And they told us that um, mm -mm. why is that none? Um, cost of preference shares. Sorry, did I give you the page number? Yeah, I gave you page 18 is the page number for the dividend growth model. Um, your cost of preference shares is on page 12, RP is equal to DP over NP, where DP is the annual preference dividend over NP, which is then your current share price, current yeah, share price, preference share price. So DP is what is my dividend, par value of 100 Rand for the, for the preference share times 9%. I'm calling it the coupon rate for the preference share, just so that you know what that means. So that's the preference share interest that we are paying over NP, 
which means the current price I would get for a preference share. And they told us that that is currently at a 10% discount. So the 100 Rand par value times 0 0.9. And that equals a cost of 10%. So we write out 10% in over there. Um, and we've got 2 million shares. So market value, 2 million shares times um again 90 rand per share so they've just done the calculations here 100 par value times 90 percent market value is then 180 million and then the last then is the cost of the bonds um which is debt 60,000 bonds with a par value of a thousand rand each currently trading at a premium of 5%. So here we've got 60,000 bonds, par value of 1,000 Rand, currently trading at a premium of 5%, so times 1.05. So that's the market value of the bonds. And then for the cost of the bonds, they told us that it has currently got a 10% yield to maturity, which means that the owner of the bond is earning 10% on that bond, which means that if the owner is earning 10% on the bond, that that 10% is there for the cost to the company. But bonds are debt, so we have to take the after-tax cost of debt, so 10% times 0.72, in other words, subtracting the 28% tax, is 7.2% cost for the debt. So now we have filled in in the table our three market values and our three costs. We add up the three total market values to get the total market value and then work out the proportions. 240 over 483, 180 over 483 and 63 over 483. And that gives us the, the weightings or the proportions of each type of capital of the total. And then we um, can calculate our weighted cost where we take 0 0.5 times 9.44 and that gives us a weighted cost for equity of 4.72 0 0.37 times 10 percent and 0 0.13 times 7.2 percent and then we add those three together to get a total WACC of 9.36%. And then the company has got that percentage to then use as their uh, discount percentage when they want to present value the cash flows for the project that they're considering. Then the last one is just a theory question. Um, they want to change its dividend policy. One of the directors has proposed they should implement a stable dividend plus bonus dividend policy. So this is your learning unit t t uh, three dividend policy. Briefly explain how a stable dividend plus bonus policy works. A couple of typos there. So again, in your learning unit three, you have got your constant payout ratio, stable dividend, stable dividend plus bonus, those three types of dividend policies. So you need to be able to explain how any one of those three works. And in this case, they asked for the stable dividend plus bonus. Um, and again, just in your own words, an explanation of how they would, how that, how that operates. And also take note, it was only for two marks. So just make sure you've got sufficient information for two marks. You can see here they have um, awarded three, there's three points that you could have given. And as long as you've given two of those three points that you'll get your, your two marks. So don't go and write a whole essay, um, but you must give enough information for all of the marks that they've allocated to that question. Okay, so that is then the end of the full paper. So I'm going to go back here and just end the um, recording. And then I will download and post this recording for you guys as well. 
Okay, guys, thanks very much and very good luck for your exams. Bye.